Hello everyone, this is Dr. Wright again. Uh, a couple months ago I posted a video on YouTube about how to execute portfolio optimization in Excel. The video was intended to be helpful but by no means comprehensive. Uh, I've been surprised there have been a lot of people who have looked at the videos. Most people have commented that they have in fact been helpful. However, I've had several people email me and ask me how exactly I created the variance covariance matrix which you can see right here on the screen. Now remember the variance covariance matrix was critical in estimating the portfolio standard deviation. It turned out that in order to estimate the portfolio standard deviation, for instance, this is the equally weighted portfolio. We estimated a portfolio standard deviation of 4.462%. The way that we did that was to take the weight matrix, or I should say the weight vector. We took the transpose of that multiplied it by the variance covariance matrix and then multiplied it again by the weight vector and that's how we got the portfolio standard deviation. Everybody seems to be pretty clear on that process. Now people would like to know how exactly we created the variance covariance matrix and so I'm here today with a supplemental video simply hoping to show you how to create the variance covariance matrix and perhaps also show you how to create the correlation matrix. Let me begin with just a little bit of instruction here. Um, let's just start with some PowerPoints if you don't mind. We know that the sigma matrix, which is our variance covariance matrix, is a K by K matrix. So if we have K assets and we have N monthly returns of those K assets, then the variance covariance matrix is going to be a K by K matrix. Now there are at least two ways to generate the variance covariance matrix in Excel. You can create it using the data analysis function in Excel. I don't recommend this. My purpose is to use matrix algebra and the array functions to try to create the variance covariance matrix. Now recall that the covariance between asset X and asset Y mathematically is defined thusly. You take each X observation and subtract out the average return to asset X. You take each corresponding Y observation and, and subtract out the average return to asset Y. So literally for every month of your data set, you have to take the return to X and subtract out its average and multiply that by the return to Y minus its average. So every month you'll have the product of those differences. And then you need to add all those up and then divide it by the number of months that you have in your data set. So to generate the variance covariance matrix, what we want to do is we want to begin with the n by k data of monthly returns. What I mean by that is if you come over here to my Excel file, I began with raw data that looked like this. You can see I have the returns to all of my assets here to my eight assets. This is simply the monthly returns from uh, December of 2008, or sorry, I should say, it's the monthly returns starting in January of 2007 going through December of 2011. If we add all those up, so I'm just going to count the number of returns that I have here, and you can see that I have 60 returns for each of these assets. So this right here, that represents my N by K data set of monthly returns. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to calculate the average return for each of the K assets. So you can see down here at the bottom what I've done is I've simply calculated the average. Um, very easy to do in Excel. Obviously you can just use the average function. Copy and paste that across and now I have all of my averages. The next step is to create what I'm going to call the excess return matrix. The way that you create the excess return matrix is for each monthly return, subtract the average return for the respective asset. For instance, to create the excess return matrix, I'm going to take this, which is the return to the S&P 500, the Spider ETF, and that was the return in January of 2007, you can see over here what we need to do is subtract from that the average. So right there is the average, we need to subtract that away. 
So over here, I'm going to create the excess return matrix. Now, I've already created it, but I'm going to go ahead and delete it out just so I can show you how to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the return to the S&P 500 minus its average return, which is right there. I'm going to lock in that row number, and I should be able to just copy and paste that across and down. And I'm not going to worry about the formatting, but this right here now represents our n by k excess return matrix. And I don't need these things at the bottom because my data actually ends right there. So again, this right here is an n by k excess return matrix where I've taken every monthly observation, the return to every asset in every month, and I've subtracted out the average return. Once you do that, and I'm going to find that, define that matrix as simply capital X, which represents excess return, then in order to get the variance covariance matrix, what you need to do is take X transpose X, and then divide by the scalar N, which in our case is going to be 60 because we have 60 observations. If you look at this formula right here, X transpose X is actually doing this part of the formula for each of the pairs. Okay, so the X transpose X is taking XI minus X bar times YI minus Y bar for every month and adding it up. And then the last thing we need to do is divide by N. So Ultimately, in order to get our variance covariance matrix, we need to take X transpose X and then divide every element in that matrix by N. So let's go do this in our data set. Okay, so we're going to execute this in two steps. First off, I'm going to take X transpose X. So I'm going to highlight an eight by eight region because again, X transpose X is going to result in a K by K matrix. I'm going to hit M multiply. We're going to transpose. And what are we going to transpose? We're going to transpose the excess return matrix. Close the parentheses. And then we're going to multiply it by itself again. Come up to the top. Highlight the N by K excess return matrix. Close the parentheses. And remember, anytime you're doing matrix multiplication, you always hit Control, Shift, Enter. Now that's X transpose X. What we then need to do is divide all of these elements by the scalar N, which in our case is 60 months. That's how many months worth of returns we have. Now this is not necessarily matrix multiplication. This is just element by element division. So all I'm going to do is this. I'm going to highlight the 8 by 8 region. Then I'm going to come up here and highlight this. And I'm going to divide it by 60. So I highlighted my K by K X transpose X matrix, and I'm simply dividing it by the scalar 60. I am going to hit Control Shift Enter to tell it to do array math. And you can see we now have our variance covariance matrix, which we used up here to determine our portfolio standard deviation. You can do just a quick eyeball check of the first few numbers in our variance covariance matrix here and see that it is in fact identical. Now, one other thing that I wanted to show you, the variance covariance matrix is necessary for estimating portfolio standard deviation. So we need it and it's helpful. Unfortunately, it's very hard to make any useful inferences from the variance covariance matrix. In other words, it's very hard to look at this variance covariance matrix and determine what the relationship is between the S&P 500 and gold. That number simply isn't very meaningful. It would be better if we could have a correlation matrix. So I also want to show you how to do the correlation matrix. Now remember that the correlation between asset X and asset Y, which we represent using row, is determined by taking the covariance between the two assets and dividing it by the product of the standard deviations. Now we have the variance covariance matrix. In other words, we have a matrix that's filled with all of the covariances and the variances. What we don't have is a matrix that has 
the products of the standard deviations. So transforming the variance covariance matrix into the correlation matrix merely entails figuring out how to create a matrix that has all the products of the standard deviations and then just dividing our variance covariance matrix by those products of the standard deviations. We begin by defining a k by 1 vector of standard deviations thusly and I'm going to call it little d just to stand for deviations. If you take d, d transpose, you would have k by 1 multiplied by a 1 by k which would actually give you a k by k matrix and the matrix would look like this. The first element would be sigma 1, sigma 1, the product of the standard deviations. In other words, that's the variance for asset 1. The second element in the first row would be sigma 1, sigma 2. In other words, that's the product of the standard deviation of asset 1 and asset 2. The third element in the first row would be sigma 1, sigma 3, which is the product of the standard deviation of asset 1 and asset 3. I'm not going to go through the tedium of the rest of this matrix, but you can see that D, D transpose indeed contains all of the products of the pairs in terms of their standard deviations. So it pairs all of our assets and multiplies their standard deviations. Well, that matrix is going to be very helpful because remember, in order to get correlations, we have to take covariance and divide it by the product of the standard deviations. Well, now we have a matrix that is filled with the products of the standard deviations. So if sigma is our k by k variance covariance matrix and if capital D is our k by k matrix containing the products of the paired standard deviations, then the correlation matrix is simply sigma divided by D. Important note, this is not matrix multiplication you would never use that symbol if it was matrix multiplication. In fact, what we're going to do is element by element math. In other words, we're going to take the first element, the element in row 1, column 1, in the uh, variance covariance matrix, and we're going to divide it by that element right there. And we're going to take the element in the first row, second column, of the variance covariance matrix, and we're going to divide it by that same element in this matrix. If we do that, think about what that will do. The, the second element in the first row of the variance covariance matrix will be the covariance between asset 1 and asset 2. We're going to divide it by the product of the standard deviation of asset 1 and asset 2. You will end up with the correlation. So literally if we take the variance covariance matrix and we element by element divide it by everything in this matrix, we'll get the correlation matrix. Okay, so we begin by defining our k by 1 vector of the standard deviations. And you can see here we have our 8 by 1 vector. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that and multiply it by its transpose. So down here I'm going to highlight an 8 by 8 area. And I'm going to do matrix multiplication. I'm going to take the vector and multiply it by its transpose. Closing the parentheses and then one more reminder that anytime you do matrix multiplication you need to hit control shift enter so we do that. So we now have this matrix that I showed you in the PowerPoint slide. This is the matrix that contains all of the products of the paired standard deviations. So that's going to become the denominator as we try to figure out the correlations. So what we need to do is take each element of the variance covariance matrix, that will be the numerator, and divide it by the corresponding element in this new capital D matrix that we've created. So here's our variance covariance matrix. Again, we're going to take every element and we're going to divide it by the corresponding element in this capital D matrix. Remember, this isn't going to be matrix multiplication. This is element by element division. It's going to be an 8 by 8 matrix when all is said and done, so we highlight an area that's 8 by 8. And all I'm going to do is highlight that, divide it by this capital D matrix, and even though it's not matrix multiplication, it's still array. It's still an array function in Excel, so anytime we're doing an array function, you still have to hit Control Shift Enter. Now, once you do that, and I'm just going to put some labels down here, just so it's easier for us to read.
Okay, now I can tell you that we did this right just by eyeballing it. And the reason that I know we did this right is that anytime you do a correlation matrix, you should get ones along the diagonal. We know that correlation, we know that row is bounded by negative one and one. Positive, perfect positive correlation would be represented by the number one. In other words, any asset that is perfectly positively correlated with another asset should have a correlation of one. Well, we can see that when we take the correlation of spider with spider, it has a correlation of one. That makes perfect sense because if you look at the formula, we're taking the covariance, sigma x, x in this case, it would be the covariance of spider with itself. Well, the covariance of spider with itself, if you look at the formula for covariance up here, the covariance of an asset with itself is just its variance. You wouldn't have xi or yi, it would be spy and spy. So if you're doing the same asset, covariance becomes variance. So in the numerator, you would have the variance of spy, and also in the denominator, you would have the product of the standard deviations, which would be the standard deviation of spy times the standard deviation of spy, which would be the variance, hence, you'd have the variance of SPY over the variance of SPY, which gives you a one. So we see along the diagonals, we see the ones. Since we see the ones, we know that we've done this right, or at least we can have some level of assurance that we've done it right. Now, why do I care? Why am I showing you how to do the correlation matrix? Like I said, you can make a lot better inferences. You see up here, for instance, we looked at the covariance between SPY and GLD. You cannot make any sense out of that number. It's a small number, but you can't make any inferences from it. However, with the correlation, we know what the bounds are. We know what the parameters are. We know that the correlation is between one and negative one, and a correlation approaching zero means there is no correlation between the two assets. We can see that the correlation between SPY and GLD is 0.11. That's pretty close to zero. There's almost no correlation between gold and the S&P 500. Interestingly enough, this is the emerging markets ETF. It's got a correlation of 0.88 with the SPY. So what that tells you is over the, at least the last five years or the five years that I'm studying, you may have thought that by putting your money into the emerging markets ETF, you were broadly diversifying away from the S&P 500 and US stocks. Not so. You can see that the emerging markets ETF is highly correlated with the S&P 500, the S&P mid cap, and the S&P small cap. And those are all highly correlated with the EFA, which is Europe, Far East, and, and Australia. If you really want to get diversification and you have your money in the S&P 500, you can see quite clearly that treasuries, corporates, and gold, at least in the data set that I'm analyzing, are where you are going to get that diversification. So I show you this not because you need it. You don't need it to figure out the portfolio standard deviation, but it sure helps you to intuitively interpret the results that you got here. Well, I hope this is helpful. If you have any more questions, feel free to email me. I can't promise that I can make more videos, but I at least thought I would throw this out there to try to help you.